yeah, I think that I think that will be good. All right, so um, welcome back for uh, Xu Fang Su's uh, third and final lecture on collider physics. Please go ahead. Okay, let me just pull in this one here to save some time. Okay, good morning, everybody. So let's uh, do the last lectures. So today's lecture is still going to be two parts. The first part is how to see those particles at colliders. I mean, so far I just talked about basically the collider itself, the accelerators. We haven't really talked about how to detect those particles. Okay, so that's the first part. And the second part is uh, uh, once you observe those particles over there, basically you will measure the momentum, measure the energies, then what kind of kinematical features we are looking for so that we can actually dig physics out of it. So that will be the second part of, uh, of today's uh, lecture. Okay, so let's go to the particle detection first. So we talk about the particle we produced when the two beam collide from lots of things coming out, but being produced not necessarily means you can actually see them. So the tools we use to see those particles are the detectors. Okay, so let's first take a look at what kind of particle being produced, as I said, it's basically eventually, you know, even if you produce new particles, they will decay down to standard model particles, plus something else. So let's talk about standard model particle first. So quarks, leptons, W plus minus, Z, Higgs, you know, all those are photons, of course, all those sort of stuff over there. Some of the guys are stable, like electrons, you know, positrons, and, sorry, sorry. <laughs> electrons and the positrons and things like that. Uh, but then some of those are not. So for example, W plus minus Z and the Higgs, those guys will decay. So for Z, W, top, Higgs, and all those things, they will be decay into quarks and leptons eventually, and they decay lifetimes. So for example, let me use WZ as an example, or somewhere you know, in over the GeV level for the for their uh, for the partial, uh, for the decay width, so the lifetime is inverse of it. So if I translate that into the lifetime, that will be about three times ten to the minus twenty-five second. Sorry about that. I was connected to my iPad, and the iPad is connected to my phone. So just uh, bear with me for a second. So those are the decay lifetime, and as far as the collider goes, thinking about you know they travel at speed of light, they will. Sorry. There'll be extremely short distance over there. Uh, how can I turn it off? Uh, okay, just, uh, just give me one second. Yeah, I'm extremely sorry about that. Okay, so that will be extremely short lifetime. So it's like instantaneous decay over there. Okay, so we'll talk about that later. How to talk up, uh, how to observe those guys over there, and the second one is quark. When you think about uh, a up quark or down quark, you know those regular quark being produced, you actually don't really see those colored objects at your colliders. What you see is they will have fragmentation or hydrogenation into basically colorless objects, like hydrons and mesons and things like that. So let's see how fast they hydronize. The time it take it to hydronize basically go over one of lambda QCD, and the lambda QCD is 200 MeV, and again, if I translate that into the second, it's about 10 to the minus 24 second. So again, that's extremely, extremely short time at collider scales. Okay, so once those guys, you know, those quark being produced, they will hydrogenize immediately. So, so all, all we observe at colliders is going to be those hydrogenized objects. So the final state objects that we see, first of all, there will be those colored particles. Eventually, they will hydrogenize and they become color neutral. Okay, so there will be like clusters of those hydronic objects, and sometimes we just call it jets. Okay, you have a bunch of guys basically coming out along a cone over there, and there's different jet definition. 
it's over there you can classify as a jet. So that's one big class of it. And the second class of it would, of course, be leptons. So for example, electrons and the muons, and those are kind of stable or semi-stable leptons you can directly observe at the colliders. And of course, we have our favorite friends of the photons. You will also see them in, through the electromagnetic cascade. And then for a set of objects we call the heavy flavor, mostly to do with the B quark, some of them to do with the charm that we can actually observe as a secondary vertex because as we were seeing a second, their lifetime is kind of right in between instantaneously decay versus semi-stable detectors. So they will actually travel certain distance in the detectors and then decay. So you'll actually be able to see a displaced vertex which we can observe at detectors. And then there's the last group, which is kind of mysterious. It's called the missing energy. So a good example of that will be neutrinos. Like you produce some, they are completely charge neutral, and the electric interaction is weak enough so that you don't actually see them at detectors. So they will appear at missing energy, and then you might wonder how would that be observed, Actually, those guys are usually not observed alone. They will produce together with the other particles, other visible particles. And then we have energy momentum conservation. So if you see a bunch of things coming out at one end and then nothing coming out at the other end, and if we take energy momentum of, uh, conservation, we know something coming out, only that we don't see them. So those are classified as missing energies over there. So neutrinos or some other invisible particles over there and we call it the missing ET, um, ET, okay? So those are basically the typical final state objects that we're going to observe at colliders. And I'm gonna talk about each of them just in a little bit more details. So we see them at detectors. And the typical size of the detectors nowadays, they are huge, okay? They are like the size of a building over there. So typically I would say a few meters. Okay, so let's just give a characteristic scales of the time that we separate between instantaneous decay to, you know, secondary vertex to absolutely stable. So the distance it will travel, it will be basically beta C tau times the usual gamma factors over there. And if I translate that into the corresponding time scales or distance scale, it will be 300 micrometers with decay lifetime of 10 to the minus 12 second, then times gamma over there. Okay, so a distance of few hundred micrometers. So those you can actually see them at the most essential part, the vertex detector part. Okay, and then you'll be able to observe the secondary vertex. So a lifetime of 10 to the minus 12 second is basically what a characteristic lifetime we'll be looking at, okay? Anything longer or much longer than that will be stable or semi-stable. Anything shorter than that will be instantaneous decay. You basically only see a primary vertex over there, okay? So here is a cartoon version or at least a serious version of what a detector look like, okay? It's, it's not the actual detector you see as, as Atlas in the CMS, which is usually a 3D picture, huge with a person standing on the side. I don't even put a person over here. Okay, but, but the the basic structure is the same. You have the beam line coming across, okay? And then the most inner part will be the vertex, oops. The most inner part will be the vertex detectors right in the middle, okay? They'll be able to tell the short, little short distance. And then outside of that will be the tracking chamber, basically be able to detect any charged tracks. So any neutral particles is not going to leave anything in the tracking chamber. And then outside of that, you typically have EKL, electromagnetic perimeters. So which are able to observe any electromagnetic showers. So electrons, photons, basically, or lose uh, all of its energy at ECAL. And outside of that will be the hydronic perimeter. Anything have strong interactions, you know, pions, pions, protons, and neutrons, and all those sort of stuff will leave, deposit all the energies in the hydronic, uh, in the hydronic perimeters. And then the most outside layer of that will be the muon chambers. And as the name suggests, you will see the muon. So muon has a lifetime, you know, really, really, 
long. So it will basically travel all the way through the detectors and hit the muon chambers. If you see anything hit the muon chambers, the typically either it's a muon, the actual muons, okay? Or it could be, you know, the cosmic rays coming, those are the bad ones coming from outside. Or it could be new physics particles, which are semi-stable or, or, or relatively stable over there. Okay, so as I said, this is a serious version of the detectors. So now let's look a little more details and see for each of the particles that you would typically see how we go, typically have, how we're going to see them at the detectors over there. Okay, so the left, so the first group of particles that we would have will either be the stable particle. Okay, we're talking about proton, antiproton, electron, positron, and the gamma. So those are really stable particles over there. So their lifetime, of course, it's much, much longer. Uh, it's, 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 it's infinite, okay? So, you can, so for example, for the electrons, what they're going to see is they will leave a track in the tracking chamber because it's charged, and then they will deposit all its energies in the, in, in the ECAL over there. So that's how an electron would look like at the colliders. Okay, and how about photons? Photons are neutral, so they're not going to do anything at the tracking chamber, but then through electromagnetic shower, it will deposit all the energy in the ECAL. Okay, so that's how electron and photons will look like. And then about protons, for example, it's charged, so it will leave a track, deposit a little bit of energy in the ECAL, and then deposit all of its energy in the hydronic cal over there. Okay, so those are the stable particles, and uh, there are also quasi-stable particles. And typically, I'm talking about a lifetime, you know, larger than 10 to the minus 10 seconds. So they will basically travel through the detectors. Okay, so those are those are guys are basically, you know, neutrons or those long-lived hydrons over there or muons, uh, you know, the pies and the k's and all those sort of stuff. So detector-wise, it's stable, okay? Because it travel all the way through the detector. So this is how a muon look like. Leave a track because it's heavy, so it's not going to deposit all the energy in the ECAL, it will deposit some. It will also deposit some in the hydron perimeters and then reach all the way to the muon chambers. So for all the standard model particles, muon is the only guy who will reach all the way to the muon chambers over there, okay? And then, you know, for the neutrons and things like that, Nothing in the tracking because it's neutral, nothing in the EM cal because you know it won't introduce electromagnetic shower, and then deposit all the energy in the hydronic perimeters over there. And basically that's it. Okay. So for those stable and the semi-stable particles, what we do is at detectors, you can directly see them. And we're usually talking about the detector resolution over here. And then let me give you some typical energy scales. So for the, for the momentum, they basically be measured by looking at the curvatures in the tracking chambers, okay? And then you can get delta P over P, basically it's proportional to the momentum and it's typically to the order of momentum normalized to 10 to the fourth GeV over there. Okay, so the reason it's proposed the resolution gets worse when the momentum gets bigger is because when the momentum gets bigger, the curvature is less. Okay, so you are less accurately to be able to measure the curvatures over there. Okay, and then the energies is usually being measured at perimeters, either at E cal or at the H cal over there. So their resolutions typically go as one over square root E. Okay, so for the E cals, it's typically about 10% for the ECAL, and for the hydronic cal, it's typically about 50% for the hydronic cal over there, divide by square root. Okay, so that's like the typical resolution we're talking about for the momentum uh, measurement and also for the energy measurement over there. Okay, so that's, um, yes. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Do you want sure. me to read them or you can see? Uh, I can see them. Okay. See. If you turn on, do not disturb. Ha. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next time I'll do that. 
uh, why don't pile on the proton deposit energies? Okay, so that's a way that the, so the second question is why don't pions and the protons deposit the energy in the EM perimeter? So the EM perimeter is designed to be sensitive to the particles which will introduce the electromagnetic shower. So which is basically the electrons, so uh, let me actually use. So if you have electrons, you basically radiate out a photon. Photon basically have pair projections of E plus and E minus, and they further radiate the photons and things like that. So this is the electromagnetic cascade. Okay, so for things like proton and the pions, they're not able to introduce those kind of EM uh, cascade over there. So therefore, they only deposit a little bit. You know, for the charged particles, they will deposit a little bit in the electromagnetic magnetic. Uh, uh, in the in the e but mostly in the hydronic cal over there. Okay, and yeah, so this really depends on you know how much it can radiate and things will depend on the mass of the particles. Muon is just too heavy for that. Okay, so the muon is not going to introduce this whole shower over there. So they will just travel right away through, just to looks like a track, and then reach all the way until the muon travels. Okay, so that's the difference between electron muon over there. Muon is much heavier, so it's not going to develop the whole electromagnetic cascade. Okay. And uh, thanks for 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 Bremen. I'll remember to do that next time. Okay, okay. So this is the first group of particles. The second group of particles are basically that have secondary vertex. So those are called vertex tagging particles. And as I said, the lifetime will be around this kind of sweet spot, such that you actually not only see the primary vertex the interaction point, you will see either something disappear or something leave as a little bit of track, and then it decay again. So you will see the secondary vertex. So let me also include a picture over here of how the secondary vertex would look like. Ah, here. Okay, so you will see there's a primary vertex over here, which is the interaction point, and then, then travels, and then you have the secondary vertex, which leaves a bunch of tracks over here. So I can reconstruct the secondary vertex by combining all the tracks, and they hit back to one point, but that point is different from the primary vertex over there. Okay, so those are typically referring to the particles, like all those different B mesons. So if it's neutral, you're going to see it disappear. And if it's charged, you're actually going to see a track. But nevertheless, the secondary vertex will be a certain distance away from the primary vertex that your vertex detectors or even involve part of the tracking chambers that be going to be able to see them. And some of the charmed mesons and even TOS, when they do the hydronic decays, you're going to see them over there. Okay, so when it goes to the, the B and the charm, they usually refer to as the heavy flavor tagging, okay? And the, the, typically, the typical resolutions is, is somewhere about 30 to 50 micrometers over there. Okay, so that's from an experimental point of view, you really need to construct a secondary vertex and then compare with the primary vertex and say, aha, I have a tagging over there. So the, the thing is so-called you know, B tagging, for example, for the heavy flavors over there. And so in the, in the future kiders, when people are talking about you know, 100 TV, you know, TP machines over here, you will see people also talking about top tagging. And that's completely different. It's not a secondary vertex. Okay, that's because when the top quark decays with T over B and the W, and the W further decays into jet, and because it's in a very high energy collisions, they basically become you know, a very relatively narrow cone over there. So by looking at your substructure of your jet, you actually be able to identify it's a top tag. Okay, so when you hear people talk about top tagging, don't confuse it with the usual vertex taggings we talk about at the detectors. Those typically refer to the things with a secondary vertex. Okay, but as a theorist, when we do the collider analysis, we don't really reconstruct all those tracks and things like that. Okay, so as a theorist, when you do any of those collider studies, what we typically do, you just use, you just multiply whatever the events you have with the corresponding efficiencies. So probability-wise, you will get it roughly right. 
Okay, so the B-tagging efficiencies is roughly about 70%, and the charm efficiencies is roughly about 40%, and the hydronic torque efficiency is typically about 40% as well. So it's kind of like a simplified ways to actually apply those tagging techniques as far as the series is concerned. Okay, so that's a second group of objects which they leave a vertex, which you can see them by a vertex tagging over there. And then the third group would be those short lived particles with the lifetime is less than 10 to the minus 12 second or, or much smaller. Okay, so once they produced, they immediately decays. Okay, so in that sense, you do not directly see them. Okay, examples of that, for example, you know, the Z's, W plus minus, Higgs, and the top, all those stuff. But what, but then how we can identify, hey, experimentally, I actually see a Z boson being produced because you don't really directly see them. So what happened is, so for example, Z goes to E plus E minus. You can see E plus E minus, and then you can measure the electron momentum and things like that. And you can actually reconstruct the back to see a Z. So we we're talking about the reconstruction of the kinematics later on for the later part of this talk. So what we do is you really use final state kinematics to basically reconstruct the resonance. Okay, so that's so therefore the kinematics is really a very, very important tool for us at colliders to see those unstable particles. Okay, because otherwise all you see is a bunch of electrons, and muons, and the photons, and the protons, and you don't really directly see those short lived particles. But there are ways for us to do that. Okay, so that's, that's going to be the focus of the second part of my talk. Okay, and then the last thing, as I mentioned, are the missing particles. So before you move on, Chu Feng, sure. there's a there are a few questions about tagging in the chat. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, okay, so again, it's about the the the, the QED showers. So they would have electromagnetic the muons. They would have electromagnetic interaction, but because its mass is so heavy, they're not going to introduce. They're not going to induce the whole electromagnetic cascade like electron would do. So it will lose certain energies in the electro, uh, magnetic calorimeter, but not all of them. So unlike the, uh, unlike the electrons and the photon over here, they were completely losing its energies and then basically stop over there. The muons will basically travel all the way through. So that's the main difference. And, it, and the, it's because the mass is heavier. And the, how does the charm and the tau? So the charm and tau tagging in principle, it works similarly okay because of their lifetime over there but it's not but it in some sense it's it's more difficult so therefore you can see the tagging efficiencies for the charm the toss they are not as high as the bees over there okay the the the, the bee lifetime it's right in the right range so you can actually see the, and given the resolution we have in the detectors you will actually be able to see the secondary vertex most of the time and not that ideal for the charm and toss and uh, are these tag efficiency the true positive rates are they accounting for the missile? Yeah, so so those so those are the true tagging rates of if it's a B, you have 70% of chance to identify that as a B, which means 30% of chance you're missing that. But that's different from the miss tag rate. Okay, which is it's not a B, like a regular quark, but somehow because of the detector issues, you misidentify a secondary vertex and they somehow count as a B. Okay, so that mistagging rate is much lower, much, 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 much lower than the 70% over there. And usually when you see it in the experimental part, it kind of goes as the higher your tagging rate is. And uh, let's see which way it goes. The, it, 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 it kind of goes proportionally, okay? The, the, the higher your tagging rate is, I think it's also the higher the mistaking rate goes. It's, the, the, there's a balance over there, okay? So eventually you choose the ideal tagging rates 
such that they will tag as much B as possible, but at the same time, do not count too much of the objects which are not Bs over there. Okay, so the, and the, the, the last one is, uh, so the efficiency for tau tagging is less because it's mostly hydronic decays, and the YS charm tagging efficiency is less. Okay, so for the tau tagging rate, yes, this tagging rate really refers to the hydronic tau. Because if the tau decay leptonically, it will be tau basically as it goes to muons, mu mu bar, and then new tau over there. Then what they do is you actually see the muon coming out of it and a bunch of missing energies. Okay, so this tagging rates, I think it really refers to the hydronic tau decays where you have one prom events or three prom events and things like that. And why is the charm tagging efficiency it's less? I think that's something to do with the charm decay, uh, the, the lifetime of the charm and things like that. So, so I don't know much about the details of the charm tagging rates, but the, 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 the B is so far the best that we have so far, okay? I think it's something to do with the, the charm lifetime and how well you can identify the final decay objects of the charm, because as you can see, you do need to identify all those checks after the decays, okay? So that was for that. And okay, let's move on. So the last objects we have over here is the missing particles. And as I said, the famous example will be neutrinos. And for those of you who know SUSY, you know, the lightest neutrinos in the SUSYs and the other bunch of new particles. So, so typically in those new physics models, if they end up have like a dark matter candidate, and those guys would typically appear as missing energies at colliders over here. So what we observe for those guys is you use the energy momentum conservation, P1 and the P2, the initial particles, will be the sum of the momentums of all the observable particles and plus the missing guys that we cannot directly see at colliders. But since we firmly believe energy momentum conservation is good, okay, so if we see the bunch of visible particles coming at one end and basically nothing at the other end, but we know that something has to be there to balance the momentum. So that means there is a particle being produced, only that you don't see them at detectors. Okay, so that basically gives us the how we get the missing particle momentum. It's basically whatever the initial ones minus the total of the, uh, minus the, the total of the observable ones over here. So the question is, do we know the initial ones very well? Okay, so at lepton colliders, so that comes with the difference of the lepton colliders and the hydron collider. So lepton colliders, yes, we do. P1 initial plus P2 initial is equals to zero. Okay, it's a perfectly good center of mass system over there. So which means the missing momentum is basically the minus sum of the observable ones. Nice and clean, all the three directions, X, Y, Z, when we know it for all. For the hydron colliders, unfortunately, we don't know the Z direction because it's a pattern inside the hydron that collides over there. So P1, initial plus P2 initial of the transpose directions, we think it's still zero because you know whatever the transverse ones in, inside the proton is going to teeny tiny. So it's a good approximation to say there's no transverse initial momentum at all. So all you can get is the transpose momentum of the missing particles is equals to the transverse moment minus of the sum of the transverse momentum over there, but you can see, say nothing about the longitudinal ones. Okay, so therefore at hydron colliders, you mostly hear people talking about missing PT, not the total missing momentum over there, because we can only know the we only know the initial momentum of the transpose guys is equals to zero. We don't know what's the initial momentum in the z direction over here. And sometimes you will hear all people also talking about missing ET, sometimes written as this one, ET with a slash, or sometimes just with that one over there, okay? And it's, uh, it's actually a little bit L-defined for this particular uh, terminology, even though we actually use that a lot. And sometimes we actually use that to replace missing PT over there. So what that is, is people would really think 
missing PT, missing ET, it's really just the amplitude of the missing PT over there. But that's only true when the mass of the missing particle is equals to zero. Okay, when the mass of the missing particle is not equals to zero, the missing ET is actually the missing PT square plus the mass square over there. So you need to be a little bit careful over there, even though most of the time, you know, people don't really distinguish some, even when I sometimes give talks, I'll just say MET without realizing I actually refers to the magnitude of the PT over there. I take the default assumption that the mass is equals to zero. So, so just a little bit extra caution over here. And I think there's a question in the chat room there. Can we be sure that transform momentum initial collision is zero, even if the hydrogen process is coming from the sea? Uh, to a good approximation, yes, because when you most, you know, when when you, oops, just a second. No. Okay. Sorry, something wrong with my pad. Okay, let me see if I can write now. Huh? Somehow do I disable my pen or what? Just a second. It's not good. Okay, to just to, to just to answer your questions, uh yeah, because we most accelerate that around the Z direction. Okay, so even if there's a little little bit of transverse versus energies, you know, inside the protons, it's it's negligible. Okay, so to a good approximation, yes, you can just fairly safely assume the initial transverse momentum is exactly zero over here. But now the question is somehow I pushed something or it's not connecting to my hmm. Just a second. Oh, okay, good. Sure. Okay. So that's for that. Okay. So 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 just next time when I hear people talking about missing ET, just to be a little bit careful. Okay. Because the, the, the more accurate language to use is actually missing PT over there. Okay. So that's basically how we're going to see them. And then the next topic I'm going to talk, talk about is something of sugar. Okay, so now we know detector-wise how we see those guys, and the trigger is never an issue at lepton colliders because, as we said, the lepton colliders, the typical event rate is, you know, one second. You have four one events. So your detector has more than enough time to, you know, to, to react to the events and record them, but not for the PP colliders. And yesterday at the end, we're basically saying for the PP colliders, the typical hydronic rate is about 100 mag, uh, mag bond over there. So for a luminosities of 10, to, sorry, of 10 to the 34 centimeter inverse and the second inverse, if we translate into event rate, it's about one gigahertz. Okay, so one second, you have 10 to the nine events, one billion events over there. And each event actually associated with a bunch of jets and uh, you know, energy deposits and things like that. So each event, you have typically one megabyte of data over there, okay? So you can view the whole detector as a very, very accurate, fast speed cameras basically keep taking pictures and save it. And I think about the regular, you know, whatever high resolution camera you have, it's nothing compared to the high energy detectors that we have. It's facing a tremendous data deposit challenge of one second, one billion events, each, billion, each event take one megabyte of data. I mean, how you ever possibly to actually save all those events? And the answer is, Impossible. Yes, it is not given the current technology over there. Okay, it's basically impossible for the for the detector electron system to actually save all those events. But on the other hand, you don't have to save all the events because most of the events are the things you don't need. Okay, my hand. There's some must be something to do with my hand today. It keeps touching the wrong thing. Okay, so the physical. Process 
that actually of interest, which are the cross sections I showed yesterday in the plot, not the topmost one. The topmost one is this hydronic, uh, the total hydronic cross section. So are the interesting events over there. The rate of that is about 10 to the minus six lower or even more. Okay, so which means out of the 1 million events that we have happened at colliders, only one event are actually interesting. Okay, so the goal we have is not record every single thing over there. The way we want is do we think of a smart way that's what trigger is, okay? To trigger on the interesting events and then recording them, okay? So that's what all the trigger was about over here. So the triggering, but so how we do the triggering, so the trigger is actually you make a very fast decision, okay? So it's a decision making using either some temporal, like you know what the typical interesting events would look like, or use some spatial correlation, okay? So say if I see something at my vertex, I see something at my tracking chamber, and then boom, I see something at my muon chambers. So I know it's a muon going through. So anything with a muon will be interesting because that typically means some hard process is actually happening, okay? So you actually design your trigger so that you can quickly make those decisions. Some of those triggers are at hardware level because when you went, want something really, really fast, you don't even have time to process them, okay? So you just add hardware where level if I see something at me on chamber, then hey, record that event. Okay, and some of them is at software level when you're doing some high level trigger over there. Okay, so for the L, so for the typical detectors, there are three different levels of trigger, each of them for the reduced events. So for example, at LHCs, the level one trigger are typically at hardware level because you're going to, you know, every second that you look at one billion events. And you quickly make decision, I threw this away, I keep it for further process. So you, put the, you, you reduce it down from one billion to 10 to the fifth. So you basically threw, you know, one out of, you know, 10 to the fourth events, you threw them away. So those are very fast hardware level triggers over there. And then you can do something more complicated and that's a level two trigger that you will further reduce it down to, uh, to 1,000 events per second. And then the level three triggers, you first reduce to the 100, uh, uh, 100 events per second. So that still seems a lot, given that each event take one megabyte data. But given the huge detector we have and the very advanced electronics, uh, that's actually good enough. Okay, so you greatly reduce it down by trigger, you basically reduce down by 10 to, seven, 10 to the seventh order magnitude, and then you basically deposit all the events to tape. And then you can do all those offline analysis and, and, and uh, try to dig out interesting physics out of it. Okay, so anything which are not triggered on, basically are gone, completely gone. Okay, you're not even going to recheck them later on because they're not saved to the tape. Okay, so the trigger, even though most of the time we kind of ignore them, it, from the experimentalist point of view, it is actually extremely, extremely important because we do with the fast happening of the events, we do want to uh, check on the interesting objects and uh, be able to record them. So the chat. And uh, can you please elaborate on the things that we don't need at hydron colliders? How do we know this? No new. Okay, so the things typically we don't need, you know, it's like when you have the proton, the protons, and the most of the time, you know, for the things that's happening, it's it's like either directly cross each other or some very low energy events that you know it's it's it, it's basically the up the things does not have very much high PTs over there. Okay, but they are still there. I mean, they are the remnant of your protons because all, but the only interesting thing that's happening is say for example you have one gluon another gluon and say, hey, I produce a top, I produce a T-bar, and then the top quark will further decays over there. 
Okay, so for those hard process, the one in red are the ones we actually need. They typically have a very large PT. Okay, they typically involve some very energetic objects. And if you see anything like electron, muon, oh, actually, I'm just going to talk about what other things you trigger on, then they, they would indicate something interesting happening. If it's just a bunch of hydronic kind of stuff, low energy, low momentum, then most of the time you can safely throw it away because those are the underlying events, okay? Yes, it is certainly possible. So the second question is, is it possible new physics events are removed? Unfortunately, yes, okay? Especially if you talk about a new physics event which have some very exotic signatures which are usually not true. So I will also mention that in a minute. Okay, so thanks for the questions, which naturally lead to the next topic, is what are the things you trigger on? Muons, if you see anything hits the muon chamber, record them, okay, because muons does not come out of nowhere. Whenever you see a muon means, you know, usually it's a Z or W or something else that being produced. So, and if you see electron, photon in the e -cal, energetic ones, yes, recording them, okay? Because if you have proton, proton, you know, collide, if you have some electron and photon coming out, yeah, something is interesting. Hydronic guys and the tall, yes, if you can do that. All the hydronic, hydronic objects is kind of, you need, to, because there are tons of hydronic objects over there, okay? So usually they, those are, the, and if you see any energetic ones coming out, you know, with a jet with PT of 100 GeV or something like that, yes, do record them, okay? And then the total energy deposit, because usually you, you just see a bunch of junk over there. But if you see some, uh, some uh, hydronic objects which deposits tons of, just by itself, deposits tons of energy in the hydronic hell, so the total energy deposit is a lot. That means some, usually that means some new particle being produced. And as I mentioned, missing ET. In the standard model, usually if we think about physics process, you don't have much missing. You have zero missing ET. The only exception is neutrino. But if neutrino is being produced, that means, yes, something is happening over there, okay? Or it could be due to new physics, then definitely recording them, okay? So those are the typical things that people trigger on over there. So let me give a particular, give you just a table of what, for the LHC, what are the usual triggers, okay? So for example, you know, you, you, you can look at the muons, electrons. So the ADA, remember the pseudo rapidity because the detector is not 360 degree coverage, especially along the beam lines, you don't. So you basically check, uh, have object in the central region. So that's what, oops. That's what all those ADA is. So you do need to, you know, have a certain ADA range which corresponding to the polar angle say the range over there. Then this is kind of the PT you are looking at. So for the electrons, muons, and the photons, you don't really require very high PT because we know anything happening over there will be interesting. So you just record them. But for the jets, especially when you only check on one jet, then it's typically very high PT jets you'll be looking at. Otherwise, you'll be recording way too many stuff. Okay, but if you check on multiple jets, then your requirement can go down a little bit lower. And also, as I said, you can check on the missing ET over there. Okay, so that those are kind of typical trigger that experimentalists they are currently using. Okay, but on the other hand, just as one of the questions that we just had, how about new physics? Is it likely you're missing new physics? You know, yes, of course. So for the new physics, especially the one that has very exotic signals, which are typically not being triggered on. So one example is, you know, probably uh, one very exotic example is uh, like you produce, uh, a, it, it's one of those quirk models. I think you just end up being produced a bunch of low energy jets, which very much look like a background over there. And then how to trigger on such events, that will be a challenge. So one of the serious job is actually think of those exotic signals and uh, which cannot currently be triggered on, but those are still interesting. Then you can propose those new triggers to the experimentalists. Okay, so that's actually one thing that we need to do. Okay, I have two questions. 
can we have triggers that depend on the angular distribution of the higher uh, of of the final states? So those, if they exist, I wouldn't say for sure because those things are kind of uh, more complicated triggers or the higher level triggers. As I said, the most of the trigger you need to do, you be able to make decisions very fast and quick. Okay, because there are way too many events over there. But for us to collect all the information about the angular, it can probably about the actual angular distributions, it will probably, if they exist, it will probably be very high level trigger over there because those kind of things you actually need to analyze the whole event and you know figure out the angular distributions and things like that. But uh, but a simplified version of that is actually, yeah, let me give you examples. It, it's actually related to, to, the, to the Higgs process. Okay, so it's Q and the Q prime goes to W. And then the other side, Q and the Q prime goes to W. And the W goes with the Higgs and the Higgs decay into stuff over there. So those jets, the kinematic features of the such kind of process, especially when the Higgs decay, you know, goes to W and the Z and leptonically or goes to gamma or something like that, there's two things. One is called forward jet tagging, which is are uh, those remnant quarks they usually goes in the forward backward uh, the, 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 the directions over there. And also you would have central jet veto, which means you don't have too much jet in the central regions over there. So those are kind of using some of the angular information, but you know, not the actual the whole you know, reconstruction of the events because those two, to process one event using the actual detector simulation, things like that, it takes time, okay? Uh, second question, I'm a little bit confused. Are the values of rapidity and the PT in the table, the central value of up the, 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 they are the lower limit, okay? So, so those means, oh, okay. So, so they are the limits when, so the question is about those values over there, what do they mean? That means, so for example, for the mu one, that means the eta of mu would be within 2.4. And then PT of the mu one is the large or equals to 6 GV. If you see something like that, trigger on the events. Okay, so that's how we read the table over here. Okay, so that's done with trigger. And I think I have a little bit less than half an hour left to talking about actually probably most important topics of, of, of the lectures. But those are the things, I'm only going to scratch the surface of it. Okay, and those are the things that you actually need to learn through your own research if you do any collider things. I'm only going to just mention a couple of them, a very basic things of them. And then when you're actually working on a collider uh, uh, project, you're actually going to learn more about it. Okay, so the topic is how we go from kinematics, which are the things we observe at colliders, other than the simple momentum and the, and the energy stuff, to actually digger the dynamics, means new physics out of it. Okay, and there are some special things that we can use or the typical things that we can use. So let me actually start from the simple thing. The left, again, lepton collider, because the lepton colliders, we know all the kinematics, basically. You can record, we know the initial state, we know the final state, you can record everything. So you have everything that we need over there, okay? One extremely, extremely useful kinematic variables is something called recoil mass, okay? And what that is, is it's actually a model independent. We like something model independent because that means you can apply that to anything over there, okay? Inclusive measurement. Inclusive means we don't even care about a particular final state, okay? So the, let me give you one example, like E plus E minus goes to something visible. And the plus the X is our interesting events. Okay, and based on what we observed for the visible part, we can actually, the recall mass actually tell us the mass of this new thing, the, the X that will be being produced. Okay, let me give you, uh, so, so the kinematics we're going to use is PE plus plus PE minus is equals to PV 
plus Px, okay? And we are not even going to measure this Px over there because we know that the Px is basically equals to all the initial state minus PV. So PV, we can completely measure this guy. This we completely know from the initial state. So if the X is produced on shell, the mass of X square is going to equals to PX square, is going to equals to PE plus, plus PE minus, minus PV, the whole thing square, okay? So the, the let's group these two together because these two are usually together. So that will be the sign of mass energies, okay? Plus MV square because this guy's, it, you, it, if, if it's actually coming from on shell particles, you, we know what the MV square is. If it's not, it doesn't matter, it's just the invariant mass. So you can get that from the experimental observables, okay? Minus two square root S of the energies of all the visible part. So this part is basically the cross product of your initial state and the, this PV over here, but because the initial state is back to back, so that there's no momentum part, there's only the energy part, okay? So S is known, this guy is known, this guy is known, and you're putting those things together, you get the mass of the unknown particles that we're interested in, okay? So let me give you a particular example. It's uh, E plus, E minus, E plus, goes to C, goes to Z and H. And the C, they can decay, okay? Say, for example, it decay into E bar, mu mu bar, quark quark bar, and things like that. This Higgs, of course, it will also decay, but I'm not even going to care about the Higgs decay. So I'm not observing anything to do with the Higgs. All I'm observing is what happened on the other side. Okay, so I can get the momentums of this FF bar system over there. I know what the energy is, I know what the invariant mass is, which basically what it tells me what the MH square is. So this actually gives us a very precise determination of the mass of the Higgs without observing the decay of the Higgs itself. Because you can see that the the stuff that I'm using are basically the machine parameters and also what's happening on the Z side. Okay, so this is so-called the recoil mass. And let me give you an example of how the whole thing actually works. This guy over here. Okay, so the X axis is a recoil mass and the Y axis is just the usual event distributions over here. And this particular one is E plus E minus goes to mu plus mu minus plus x, okay? And given the mu plus mu minus, I can reconstruct, I can measure the, the mu on momentum very well. So I use this equation over here, I can reconstruct the so-called recoiled mass. And you can see that it's basically peaked at 125 GeV, which indicates you have a new particle being produced. Okay, so this is, so this is probably the most important uh, or simplest kinematic quantities at lepton colliders that we can use to detect any new particles. Okay, it's so-called a recoil mass and it's pretty much does not depend on your model. For example, it does, I mean, of course it depends on the model that Higgs being produced, but it does not depend on whether the Higgs decay into any final state. So even if the Higgs decay invisibly, I can still get the Higgs mass through this recoil mass over here. Okay, so that's, uh, I have a chat over here. If two plus, okay, so, so, so you're, okay, so the question actually going ahead of me. If two plus invisible particles are produced, we can see a broad distribution of recall mass. Is this still a way to infer the mass of individual invisible particles with just, okay, so this recall mass works when one particle being produced over here, okay? And or if the further particle being, if the Higgs is decaying to two other particles for the decays, it still works. But if, if, if instead of one Higgs, you just have, you know, Z with something else, like two particle being produced, then it cannot tell the mass of the individual ones or even their combined ones, if not coming from a heavy resonance decays over here. Okay. And the, uh, yeah, and then we'll talk about the multiple invisible particles later on.
Okay, so, so for the moment, just take this as a two-body process, then you can use the recall mass to get the mass of the, of the objects over there. Okay, and then given the time, let's not say too much about the end point of energy distribution. or the mass edge of some invariant mass distributions. Okay, so, so I leave that in my lecture notes, which will be up uploaded later, but you can dig out more details over there. So, so but, but just a, a simple one sentence summarize of what I mean over here. So if I have E plus E minus goes to, okay, for those of you who are Susie lovers, okay. <laughs> The, the, the smuons pair, but each of the smuons pair would goes into muon plus some missing energies over there. So you're going to absorb those muons. Okay, so by looking at the energy of the muons and that they have a certain distribution pride wise, okay, you will see a end point. And the end point will be related to the mass of the particles that's involved. Or if I look at the invariant mass of the muons, again, you're going to see a edge. So the edge is going to, again, indicate the mass of the particle that gets involved. So those are kind of more advanced kinematic variables that you're going to use, okay? And, oh yes, yeah, and, uh, okay, let me, okay. So another thing at lepton colliders that you can use, it's very good, it's something called forward, backward, A symmetry, and it's called a f b. And this is typically being so a forward backward asymmetry is defined as number of the events in the forward directions. You know, if you pick a particular beam direction to be forward, and the number of the events in the backward direction divided by the sum of them. Okay, so what's so nice about this particular asymmetry at lab when they do all the ZPO measurement, you can see this A forward backward one has been used quite a lot. Okay, the reason is if you write that out, this would be related to say the left hand couplings of the fermions and the right hand coupling of the fermion. So this asymmetry will be related to that. So by measuring this asymmetries, you actually know the chiral couplings of the fermions in your particular model over here. Because you know, for example, for the Z couplings, we know that it's coupled to the left hand quark, it's different from the coupling to the right hand quark. So by measuring this A forward backward, you would actually be able to pin down what the actual coupling is. Okay, so again, given the time, let me also just don't say too much about it. You can find more details in the notes. And another thing for the lepton colliders is something called beam polarization. And this can only be reached, for example, in the linear colliders, because for the circular machine, it's very hard to achieve the polarizations, but for the linear colliders, you can actually have. Okay, so the beam polarization, because again, those coupling structures of the particles, by choosing the, the polarization of the beam, I can actually either enhance certain process or suppress certain process, because ideally what we want to do is to enhance the signals and suppress the background over there, okay? So by making use of the beam polarizations, it will actually help us, for example, to enhance the signal productions, but to suppress the main background production over there, which is a way for us to increase the signal to background ratios, okay? So again, let's just mention that in passing. These are much easier to be done at lepton colliders and at hydron colliders, you have to convolute it. For example, the forward backward, backward asymmetry, you have to convolute it into the pattern distribution function. So it's, get, it's still doable, it just gets slightly more complicated over there, okay? But I do want to go to my next topic, which will be something to do with, uh, can be applied to both hydron colliders and the lepton colliders, and it's something to do with the missing ET, which I think it's actually very interesting and important, and it's used very widely. Okay, so that's something called transverse mass variable. 
Okay, but before we talk about transverse mass variables, let, let me just talk about the usual ones, the invariant mass. So this, for the lepton colliders, as I said, I can use a recoil mass. But for the hydron colliders, I cannot use a recoil mass. So for the hydron colliders, how do I know the mass of a particular object over here? It's actually not so difficult. Like if I have a resonance decaying into particle A and the particle B, but both particle A and the particle B are visible, which means I can measure the momentum of each of them. Then the mass of R square is basically PA plus PB square. And so you're basically looking at, and, the, and, 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 and the, given the cross-section behavior for the resonance peak, you're basically looking at a peak in your event distributions. So this is what's usually called bump hunting. So it works even at hydron colliders. You just look at your final state, reconstruct the invariant mass, and to see what you get. So let me give you an example of that. That's, uh, okay, let me see where it's at. This guy over here. So even though we don't at the hydron collider, so we don't know what's the initial momentum, what the initial Z component momentum is, it doesn't matter. I just look at my final state and construct my invariant mass. And because my cross sections has this oops, particular form over there, I know I'm going to get a peak in the place where I have the actual particle being produced. Okay, so this left plot is basically for the E plus, uh, for, for the invariant mass of the electron positron distributions. And uh, you can see it's basically peak at MZ. So that indicates a Z boson being produced. This is a famous Higgs discoveries where you're looking at the gamma gamma and you can see that it peaked, you, you, you're looking for this bump. Okay, so that's where the name usual bump hunting come from, because in the event distribution, you actually try to see a bump being appeared in the invariant mass distributions. Okay, this one on the right is kind of interesting because this is H goes to ZZ, okay? And each of the Z decay into four lepton, uh, decay into two leptons. So you have four lepton events. So even though the particular example I give you is for the two body final states, but even for the four body final states, it works because M of H square is basically sum of all the PI square over there. So it will be the, you just add up the energy. So for example, here I say it's EE mu mu system. So you add up all the energy of them and the subtract minus plus P mu plus plus P mu minus, just subtract all the momentum square. And then you will get a P as it's being shown over here, which will be related to the mass of the Higgs. So the invariant mass, it means it's, it, it, it's not as nice as the recoil mass because the recoil mass, I actually don't know what my particle decay, all I need to know is how the other guy decay. And that's it. And this guy, I do need to know how my particular particle decays and I measure all the final state momentum. But on the other hand, this guy can be used for both the lepton colliders and the hydron colliders. So, so, so this one is more generally used, even though you do need to measure more information uh, for this particular process over here. Okay, so that's for the invariant mass. So what are the transverse mass that I just mentioned? Just a second, let's see a chart. Bump hunting works only for S channel, yes. Yeah, so I forget to mention all those are the S channel process. For the T channel, will be different, <laughs> okay? So, so yes, all, all those, let me say, it's S channel. Okay, so what is this particular transverse mass of variables over here? That usually happens when you have some missing particles. And we do know that for lots of new physics, we do have missing particles. So a famous example, let's go back to the standard model. The W goes to E mu over here. We have no way to measure this, this neutrinos, uh, ne uh, neutrino momentum. So we can only get for the hydron colliders. All we have is the PT of the neutrinos, which is sum of the PT of the visible particle. So that we just mentioned over here. So which means I cannot construct the invariant mass of the electron 
and the muon system because I don't know what's the, the ZPZ of the neutrinos over here. But on the other hand, I can construct something like this, M square of the E mu of the transpose ones, which is the energy of the electrons and the energy of the neutrinos, both the transpose ones, I'll tell you how that's defined in a second, minus PE of the transpose plus P mu of the transpose square, okay? So the transpose energy is basically PT squared plus M squared. So both electron and the neutrinos, the mass is tiny, so it's basically equals to the amplitude of the transpose momentum over there. Okay, so I can, so based on my measurement, I can construct this object. This object, of course, it's not going to be a single point, single uh, value because that it's a transverse. It's, it's not the entire thing over here. But on the other hand, when you look at its distributions, it's going to be less or equals to the original invariant mass. So you're going to see a distribution, but you're going to see an edge of it. Okay, so that, for example, can show you an example of how that looks. I think it's this guy over here. So this is the transverse mass of the Ws. And you can see that it has a nice edge over here, which is, oops, I draw my edge a little bit. It's a W mass. So it's somewhere about this way. Okay, so ideally, if you're in the ideal world, you will see a very sharp edge right at MW. Okay, so that would be good, which means even though I cannot completely reconstruct the invariant mass by using the transverse mass, I can still somehow get the information of the mass of my original particle is. Okay, but on the other hand, you can see there's a long tail over here. So that long tail is because, you know, the energy resolution of your system, the decay width of the Ws and all those kind of things. So you would have a tail over there. But otherwise, you would at least see a edge-like behavior, which will roughly give you the ideas of what the original particle mass is. Okay, so that is a basic idea of the transverse mass when you're not lucky enough to know all the full momentum of the object. That happens when you have a missing particle when you add hydrogen colliders. Okay, but the two body final state, it's really simple. How about multi body final states? Okay, when you have and especially when you have more than one missing particle. So let me give you example for both, okay? Because in those cases, so for the two body final states, you have a unique way to define what my transverse mass is. Okay, there's no other way around. That's basically the only way. But in the case when you have multi-body final states or when you have multi-missing particles, you actually have a choice. You can define your transverse mass in a different ways. They all call the transverse mass. They all have this kind of uh, edge behavior, okay? Then as for which particular transverse mass, and you do have a freedom to use whatever the one you favors, okay? And then which particular one you want to use, it's more or less depends on, you know, your particular process or the signal to background ratio and all those things. So that there's no given rules, okay? You have to work for your particular process and see what happens. So let me give you a couple of particular examples. So, if we, so the, let me still use the W as example, okay? So the Higgs decay into W plus and the W minus. One W goes into two jets, the another W goes into E mu, okay? So this is the case I have a four body final states and the one missing particles over here, okay? So the obvious transverse mass I can think of is Okay, good, I know it's coming from W plus and W minus. Okay, so let me build my system like I can combine the two jets into one W and the electron with whatever the missing PT into the other W. So the transverse mass I'm gonna define will be this, EW1 transverse plus EW2 transverse square minus PT of W1 transpose, uh, I already have transpose, PT of the W2 
square. Okay, so that's certainly one way to do it. That based on the fact that I already know how the process is going. I know the two jets coming from one W, the another uh, electrons coming from the other W, and I, I, I do my missing ET as my usual way over there. Okay, and we're going to find out you also have an upper limit. So by looking at the edge, I'm going to find out what my Higgs mass is. Okay, but say some other students, I mean, our detector wise experimentalist, all we can see is we have a JJ E new final state. Okay, I might not even know that the 2J is coming from 1W, but somehow this is a final state I observe. Okay, so some students decide to group it differently. Say, I can define my another definition for the transverse mass, which is I put the E of the JJE, that system together, and I have the missing ET part. And then I minus the corresponding momentum part. So that's certainly another definition for my transverse mass, which is different from the previous one because I group it differently. Previously, I grouped two W together. This one, I basically just group JJE together. And you can work out the kinematics and you can also find that they peak, they have, up, um, they always have an up limit of the MH square over here, but these two obviously are different. So which one you're going to choose? It's more or less a choice, or your personal choice. It depends on the process. For this process, I'll probably use the top one because I already know kind of the dynamics of it. I know they come from two Ws over there. Okay, so that's one example. Another example is same process, W plus W minus, but this time this guy goes to E1, new E1, and this guy goes to E2, new E2 over here. Okay, so I actually have a process of, sorry, okay, of two missing particles. Okay, but that's from the physics point of view. Collider-wise, I'm not going to see two different missing energy. All I'm going to see is one missing PT, that's it, because they all combine together. I cannot say part of that is due to, you know, one neutrino, part of that due to the other neutrino, you can tell them apart. So you just have one PT over here. Okay, so in the case of this, how are you going to define your transverse mass? That's a different question. Okay, so the event I'm going to see is E plus E minus plus missing ET over here. So for example, one transverse mass definition that I come up with would, you know, I do them separately. So E E plus plus E E minus plus missing ET square minus PE1 transpose plus uh, E plus PE minus transpose plus ET missing the sky square. I can certainly define that. I just uh, group thing. I just uh, work things out separately. Okay. And uh, so, so that will be a natural way of defining it. But another student might say, hey, the E plus E minus looks very familiar. You know, the, the Z can go to E plus E minus, for example. So maybe I should group together the E plus E minus and then see what's happening. So another way of defining transverse mass, the first part, yeah, okay. So I'm going to look at the E plus E minus system. So it will be PT of the E plus E minus square plus invariant mass of the E plus E minus square. So that's one ET and the plus missing ET, this one square, then minus the corresponding momentum part of it. So that is actually a separate definition of the, of the invariant mass square. Okay, so the point I have over here is to show you when you have multiple state finals, uh, multi-particle final state, or when you have more than one missing energies, uh, I mean, one missing particle over there, you do have the choice to choose your invariant mass, uh, transverse invariant mass variables. Okay, so let me actually show you the, the actual how, how they actually look like. This one. Okay, so this is the example I just gave you, H goes to W plus W minus. The 
red one over here is a true invariant mass distribution, okay? Very nice Gaussian peak over there, right at mass of the Higgs. So that's not a standard model Higgs, it's some other heavy Higgs over there, okay? So this one, for example, both W decay into four jets. Then I can completely reconstruct the object, okay? So this guy is the usual MJJ JJ part. And then the green one, I think one of them, yeah, this guy, the green guy over here is when I have the JJ E new final states over there. So I only have one missing particles, but I have multiple final states. And the, this particular one, I think it's the one that using the WW transpose, uh, the, 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 the two Ws, I group that together into one, group that together into one. Okay, and you can still see the green ones. I mean, even though it's not as nice as a Gaussian peak, but it still kind of have an edge which sits near where the Higgs mass is, okay? And then the blue ones and the black ones are the example I just showed, that's the E plus nu and the E minus nu bar, where I have E plus E minus final states, but I could have two different ways to define the transverse mass. And they have a much wider distributions, of course. I mean, now I have two missing particles instead of one missing particle, but they all have a upper limit, again, on the Higgs mass over there. Okay, so let me emphasize the choice of your missing uh, of your uh, transverse mass variables depend on your actual process and depend on your signal over uh, over background ratios and the, usually you should experiment around the different ones and see which one would give you the best the signal to background ratio. Okay, so and there are and this is S channel process as I mentioned. There are t interesting T channel process, which. I have one page on my lecture notes, but given the time, I'll probably just skip. But as I just mentioned, the famous examples. It's a Higgs production through the weak boson fusion. There are some very nice features of those key channel ones over here, okay? And unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about <laughs> the big topic, search for new physics, how you make use of all we learned so far to actually looking for new physics. Okay, so if you look at uh, Matchup's Tassi notes, which I mentioned in my first lectures, at the end of, uh, of his lecture notes, he lay out a very nice uh, a 12 step procedures of how you actually looking for those new particles over there. Okay, so given that my job is mostly tell you guys about the basics of the kind of physics. I will, uh, I, I leave one page of notes in my lecture notes so you can look at, but otherwise I will refer you to other lecture notes to digging out the details about the basic principles of how to looking for new physics, as well as for a particular new physics, you know, the Susie's is one of the favorite, and you know, little Higgs, King Higgs, you know, all those sort of stuff, or you know, multi, uh, to extrapolate all those kind of new physics models, there are specific notes which are about that. Okay, so given that, let me think I'm five minutes over. Sorry about that. Let's just conclude. Concluding remarks. And I hope, given the short time, I have given you a flavor of the kind of physics. And hopefully I've convinced you colliders remains to be a very, very important tool. Be our main tools for the for the for, for the new physics searches over there, both the current colliders and the future colliders over there. Okay, and I have been basically introduced you some basic techniques. Okay, and also intros to those uh, to those different kind of colliders, what they are good for, and the, what's the disadvantages and the how we actually observe particles and things like that, okay? And I hope within those, it basically serve a basis for you guys who are interested in collider physics to be able to start your collider research. And even for those of you whose main interest is not collider physics, and I hope I have given you a flavor of what collider physics looks like, so next time when you listen to a collider physics box, you at least can understand the first half of the talk. Okay, thank you guys. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Siobhan. Um, there's a few questions in the chat, I think. Mm -hmm. um.
Uh, okay, so let me start from the last one goes backwards. Okay, yeah. bump hunting works. Uh, no, no, I think those are already answered them. Yeah, bump oh, okay. hunting works okay. only for S channel. Yes, it only works for S channel. For the T channels, given the momentum transfer, the Q square is negative, so you're not going to see the resonance over there. But for the S channel, yes. And uh, yeah, and I have talked about multiple right. uh, invisible. Oh, yes. Yeah, so for those, the MT2, okay, uh, yeah, so the MT transverse mass variables that I talk about, it's kind of like a traditional way of looking for things when there are missing particles involved. But if you pay attention to the more recent development, about, I mean, the development in the past 10 years, you will hear people talking about the MT2 variables, which is a new variables which are defined to, uh, to looking for process involved Again, multiple missing particles. So this is a more newer development. The definition of the MT2 is actually very complicated. So that's why I did not include it here. But for those of you interested, you can look up for the MT2 variable as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have one more comment. It seems to me that electron positron collider are better than uh, the proton colliders given the trigger stuff and the incomplete. <laughs> Okay. It depends. Okay, so so the inference, so, so the main thing, so, so it always come back and haunt us. The main thing about the E plus E minus colliders, everything is so good, okay, except its energy reach. It's limited by the square root of S because I cannot produce particles with when I don't have enough energy over there. Okay, and the best one we have so far for the moment, for the, for example, for the RLC, it will go all the way. If there's upgrade, it will go all the way to 1.5 TeVs. And the most advanced one we have is a some version, which is click. It goes to three to five TeV, which looks extremely nice for the for, for the E plus E minus colliders. Okay, but then I cannot access particles beyond that. Okay, so say most of the new particles being peer produced, so that's a very likely choice. So I have two new particles, new particles, assume they're identical, so the mass of those new particles is square root S over 2. I'm really limited by that. Okay, and even that is ideal case over here. But for say for the 100 TeV PP machine, so the, I mean, if, if, if you're asking for experimentalists, they probably don't like the PPP machines just because it's so messy. It's, it's such a hard job to you know, dig anything out of it. But it does have yeah. one advantage, and that advantage kills it all, is that it's really an energy frontier machine. Yeah, I mean, I think the difficulty is that unless you're going to go linear, you're really limited in energy in the E right. plus E minus by synchrotron radiation, right? So, so right. the LHC in so the same the channel was yeah. left. Right, and let the maximum center mass and mass energy, I think, was 209 GeV, and LHC right. it's 14 GeV, right? So yeah. that's a big difference, and that's all synchrotron radiation, basically. Right, so when we talk about circular machines, the maximum energy square root of S for E plus E minus, you can probably go to, if you really stretch it, if you build the tunnel huge, still, you probably, you, you can reach TT bus threshold, and that's it. For the circular machine, there's no way you can go unless you use some some brand new okay. technologies. Hundred kilometers. Uh, exactly. 100. Even for yeah. one hundred kilometer, you can probably just get to three fifty. So anything higher has to go to those linear machine, which technology wise, it's very difficult. Okay. But for proton protons, mm -hmm. you really don't have too much trouble to go to higher energies. So even though it's a very messy environment, but you do have the chance to reach higher energies, which means you can produce new particles. So therefore, the PP machines, usually people call the discovery machines. If you have some new particle never been seen before, but they are heavy, so difficult to produce, the first, very likely the first chance you're going to see them is at PP colliders, because you do have the energy to be able to reach to those high energies over there. So the PP is usually called a discovery machine. It's like the first step, you discover new particles, and then you'll probably build a dedicated machines of E plus E minus to study the properties of those new particles over here. So this, for example, is a strategy being taken, for example, for the Higgs over here. We discover Higgs at LHC, and that's why people propose those E plus E minus Higgs factories to study the property of the Higgs to detail. So I would say these two machines, they are complementary to each other. Ideally, we hope we can have both. In the real world, we don't know, okay? We are hoping, keep finger crossed. 
Yeah. I mean, I totally, I totally agree with the comment about E plus E minus colliders. Like, yeah, but yeah. I mean, we have to live with what physics yeah. does, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, what I other... think plus e minus. Even when I do, you know, if you give me a physics project, I would rather to work on a process on the E plus E minus than work on a process on the PP machine. Even as a theorist, I have my bias of the E plus E minus <laughs> machines. Yeah, it's just so much easy to analyze. Yeah. At 100 PP, my guess is proton might also radiate a lot. Yeah, they will radiate a lot, but you can use higher magnets. You at least, you know, it, it's not a hard cut off over here that the synchrotron radiation is so much that it's not possible. For the proton machines, I mean, proton is, you know, 200 heavy, 2,000 times heavier than the electron. No, I'm talking about 0.5. Yeah, yes. Okay. <laughs> so this, and the synchrotron radiation goes as E over M to the force power over there. So you can get much higher. And the, the worst case, I just build a bigger ring over there. Okay, so the, the, the ring is still an advantage because you can keep circulating and keep build up energies compared to you know, the linear machine, you only have one shot over there. I, I think the limiting factor on the proton machine is the strength of the magnets that yeah. keep the beam going yeah. in a circle. Exactly. So, so that's not, not so much even the synchrotron radiation. Right. Is that true? Yeah. It's, it's, it's basically the, the, the how strong the magnets need to be to be able to accelerate particles to a high energy over here. So, so there the bottleneck is still how you accelerate the particle to the energies, not much of energy loss because the energy loss is still, I mean, small compared to you know, the, your, your limitation by the magnets. So if you listen to those, you know, C, uh, SPPC talk or the uh, FCC HH talk, Lots of their machine discussions is about the magnets, you know, super uh, superconducting magnets and how you can achieve high te uh, high teslas. And I think for the moment, the best one they probably is achieved at Brookhaven. I think it's a twelve something tesla or something like that. And I think they were talking about thirty tesla magnets that's needed in order to achieve one hundred TeV over there. So. Ha, huh, what goes on wrong with the muon collider again? The large mass will decrease synchrotron radiation. Yes, yeah. So, so that's why for the muon colliders, so now back to muon colliders. Okay, so one obvious thing you can think of is muon decays, right? The muon have a lifetime of 10 to the minus eight second. And, and so, so you, you cannot, it's not like electron and positron uh, or protons, I can just to keep circulating them, accumulate enough luminosity. The muons, you can only circulate them enough before they decay, then they collide, right? Because otherwise they decay, they decay. And there are lots of side effects associated with the decay because that will be your you know, background for your event or something like that. And another thing I think with a muon collide, there's something to do, uh, but, but the muon collide does have its advantage though. So it's easier to go to higher energies and the ring is much smaller. Okay, if you think about the Fermi lab with one kilometer rings over there, if you put a muon collider and you can easily achieve multi TeV, it has no problem at all. Okay, so, so the problem is not to go to higher energy. The bottleneck for the muon collider, I would say to get a focused beam and taking care of the decay, is, uh, decay issues. And I think that's something also with the cooling, but I think the cooling part is something to do with the, the focused beam size. So yeah, they because you have to produce them. You have to produce right. them in the first place. And then, and then yeah. you have to produce enough of them in the beginning. So I think it's more it's more the the, the luminosity issues and how to get, you know, the, the luminosity goes to like F of N1, N2 over A. So you need to get enough of the bunch over here. You need to reduce the beam size to really be highly focused. And uh, yeah, so so it's so, so it's it's more technology wise, but not in terms of the energy reach. It's in terms mm -hmm. of the other aspect. So people are discussing those muon colliders. Yeah. So, but not as uh, I would say, not as a main effort. And also, those muon colliders, people never viewed them before, right? So the electron <laughs> machine, proton machine, they are kind of more or less mature technology in terms of people more or less know in principle how it works. Okay. There's still technical advent, uh, uh, challenges and things like that. But at least those, you know, 50 years more experience in those machines, but muon colliders and also in you know, a photon collider, there's something completely new that we need to worry about.
Yeah. So Tom, Tom just sent me a, a message saying for the coffee break, um, let me suggest if you can make it today to yeah. go into the Tao, Tao room. Sure, I will go to the Tao room. Yeah, okay. so it'll be once at the usual time, right? And then yeah. we we'll also have the discussion time at 3.45, right? Yes, so the discussion, yeah. so after the, the last lecture starts at 2, and that is Adam, I think. I keep forgetting. Yeah, it's Adam. And then uh, the discussion starts at... 3.45 and that's yeah. uh, Shufang and uh, Laura Reyna. Yeah, so I'll be in one room for half of time, go to another room for another half of time. Yeah, and I think, I think I made a suggestion in the Slack already about who starts where, but mm -hmm. I, will, I will double check. Yeah, so let me address this the last questions before, before we get off. Then we can check more during coffee break and the discussion time. So I have questions. How far is it to make colliders in space around the... <laughs> around the earth okay <laughs> that's really a sci-fi question you, you you need to get people up there right i mean unless we're doing everything online in zoom otherwise we still need the in-person operations and and all this all the technical support so so for the moment i think all the colliders we're talking about are on the earth yeah but but, but actually there is a, there's a, a very interesting article which is posted in the slack channel that i looked at this morning talking about the new acceleration techniques because it seems like for the moment, we are more or less limited by our accelerating uh, technologies because we are still looks like we're using ancient time technologies of using electromagnetic uh, the, the EM waves to accelerate particles. You know, all the detect all the collider we're talking about using that. And there are discussions about you know, new techniques like using lasers and things like that. I would say those are certainly very nice. It would be good that if we have people really focus on the accelerated technology to be able to revolutionize the world, uh, the, the whole, because that will completely, maybe completely change the design of the accelerators. It might even you know, be a tabletop accelerators. I mean, we no longer have those luxury nowadays. We're talking about huge accelerators. But with advance in the, in, in the laser technology or whatever accelerator technologies that might become reality in the future, but I would say probably not in the near future, because even with known technologies to be able to start design, build, commission, with accelerators, it usually takes 30 to 40 years of time to actually make a collider become, you know, from a scratch on the paper to become something which is real. Okay, so it's certainly good people developing those uh, technology nowadays, but uh, for the moment, I think it's more or less just a concept of proof. You know, you can do that in a short distance and maybe just, you know, for certain energy, but not in real yet. Yeah, so let me just put it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so otherwise, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess I'll see you guys at coffee break and also discussion time. Okay, feel free to drop by and uh, we can discuss more fun stuff. Okay, okay. Well. thank you very much, Shifan. See you later. Yeah.